Perfect. So, hi. <laughs> um, just before we get started, I'm just during the presentation, I'm going to ask everyone to keep their mute buttons on. There's going to be time for discussion and questions at the end. Um, if a question occurs to you during uh, the presentation, you can put it in the chat. I'm not going to see it because I'm going to be <laughs> sharing my screen, but Heather will see it and take note of it. Or you can just jot it down somewhere else or hold it onto it in your head if that's the thing that works for you. Um, it wouldn't for me for sure. Uh, and then save them all for the end, basically. Um, the body of the presentation is about 90 minutes. We're going to take a break roughly an hour in. I didn't actually time where that <laughs> where that break falls, um, but it's a, in about an hour. We'll break for about 10 minutes, so you'll have time to make another cup of coffee or use the bathroom or whatever else you want to do. So bear with me. I hope, <laughs> I hope the technology all works for us today. Um, I think it will, but yeah. So this presentation is the culmination of not just months of study at this point, over a year, uh, but years of personal interest and involvement. I spent almost two months in Syria in the fall of 2000 for reasons I'll get into in a moment, but because of this, I've always had an interest in the country. And when it started being in the news, uh, starting in 2011, and then in a much bigger way in 2015, when the refugee crisis caught the world's notice, I started paying closer attention again. So as I said, I ran the music program at the Anglican Cathedral in Quebec City for five years, from 2013 to 2018. And in 2016, the Dean and I started a private refugee sponsorship group to bring a Syrian family to Quebec. When the provincial government shut down the private sponsorship program in 2017, I still wanted to work with Syrians coming into the city, so I volunteered with the Centre Climat Technique de Québec on and off for that year. When the pandemic started in March 2020 and I was suddenly working from home, I took what had been a very part-time research project out of my own interest and decided to do a deeper dive into what's happened in Syria since I was there, specifically the failed civil uprising that started in 2011, the ensuing and ongoing refugee crisis, a look at Canada's response and where things stand now. So this presentation starts off with some of my own old film photos from October and November of 2000. Um, you'll see the old fashioned date stamps in the corners of some of them, uh, but the rest of the presentation will feature something else. As I was reading and researching, I discovered something that took me somewhere a bit unexpected. Under the Assad regime, artistic culture in Syria had always been repressed and controlled through state uh, censorship, uh, and it still is. When the revolution broke out in 2011, Syrians also began to express themselves artistically in a way that had never been permitted, still is not permitted. A really dedicated group of people have taken it upon themselves to curate an online archive that strives to document every single piece of revolutionary art that Syrians have produced starting in 2011 and continuing today. Uh, as of this morning, there are over 11,300 uh, files in that archive, uh, all of which I've now seen at least three times. Um, they take the form of photography, political cartoons, sculptures, paintings, documentaries, songs, theatrical pieces, political graffiti, and protest signs. I've collected just a tiny fraction of these to show the revolution directly through Syrians' voices. Meanwhile, for me personally, my own old film photos have become for me more than just personal memory, but now testaments to Syria as it was before. So, all right. There we go. So my personal interest in Syria started in the spring of 2000. At the time, there were two employees of the NGO called Mennonite Central Committee working in Damascus as English instructors at the university. They met the patriarch of the Syriac Orthodox Church at an event who asked them what Mennonites are. They talked about the Protestant Re Reformation, which he had vaguely heard of as sort of a blip in the Catholic Church's history. Um, they explained where Mennonites emerged, and when he asked them what distinguishes Mennonites from other Protestants, they explained that Mennonites are part of a group called the Historic Peace Churches and believe in nonviolence, and added that, as an ethno-religious group, Mennonites are also kind of known for singing well. The patriarch thanked them, and they thought that was that, until they received a letter from his office several weeks later, 
He said that he was intrigued by what he had learned about Mennonites and asked if they could possibly arrange it so that he could hear some Mennonites sing. They were a bit bewildered, frankly, <laughs> about how to handle that request, but contacted their head office in Akron. So fast forward to me at the age of 20, sitting in church at First Mennonite here in Winnipeg, where I grew up, on Easter Sunday morning, reading a call for auditions to sing at a choir whose sole purpose would be to go to Syria to sing for the patriarch. So I ended up getting chosen as a representative from the Canadian Prairies, and the trip was set to depart in mid-June that summer. However, I couldn't know at the time that a major historical change was about to take place in Syria. Two days before my trip was scheduled to leave, the Syrian president, Hafez al-Assad, unexpectedly died. The borders were closed for over a month, and I ended up going in October, November instead. So this is Syria as I experienced it that fall. This is the old city in Damascus. Believe it or not, uh, motorized vehicles do go down these streets. You sort of learn how to press yourself into walls. Little food carts and vendors are everywhere. All the businesses are tiny. Very frequently, the only employee would be the owner of the shop. So in traditional Arabic culture, the way to establish a city is to build a mosque in the center and immediately build a market around it. Those two things are like the pillars. Uh, so this is the Souk al Hamadiya. A Souk is a market uh, in Damascus. This is one of the interior parts. I'd never seen so many donkeys before I was there. So this is the entrance to a women's bathhouse, a hammam. It's a Turkish style bathhouse. They're segregated by male, female gender. So that was an experience. Some very Orthodox Sunni Muslims believe that if you make con eye contact with a camera, it will do something bad to your soul. So I had asked this man's permission to take his photo. He said I could take it, but that he wouldn't look at me, which was fine. Whereas these boys selling bread, it's called kaak. It's a hollow bread ring, kind of like pita, filled with a spice mix called za'atar. Um, they actually chased me down and asked me to take their picture. So this is the, the modern city outside of the old city gates. This is right up around where I was staying. It's an area called Bab Tuma. It's where, it's the traditional Christian part of the city, which I'll explain in a second. Um, but yeah, you can see this is, this is how it looked before. There are cars. Um, you can see there's a little truck kind of in the center of the photo. Um, I don't know if my cursor will be in the same place, but this is called a Suzuki. It's a little truck that's very common there. Uh, it runs with a motorcycle engine, so it's just we. Uh, they're most typically used for carrying produce around. So to understand Syria's present situation, it's really important to understand its context in recent history. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, the Ottoman Empire was crumbling, uh, early 20th century. Um, as persecuted Christian minorities formed independent countries like Greece, Bulgaria, and the Balkan countries, they frequently de declared themselves officially Christian nations and expelled all of their Muslim residents in, retalia sorry, in retaliation for centuries of abuse under the Ottomans. Those Muslims most frequently fled to the Arabian Peninsula to the region historically known as the Greater Levant or in Arabic, Bilad al-Sham. Syria's modern day borders were the creation of a secret agreement between Britain and France called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which carved up the Arab regions of the Ottoman territory to be ruled through French and British mandates. Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan fell under French mandate while Iraq fell under British. These borders created artificial divides which had never previously existed which affected and continue to affect the Kurdish people more than anyone else. The area historically known as Kurdistan, which has never been an official nation, is the indigenous homeland of the Kurdish people. Kurdistan was divided by the Sykes-Picot agreement between Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, sometimes overnight, sometimes dividing, literally dividing shepherds from their own sheep. 
Um, and none of these countries have offered the Kurds national citizenship or even passports for the most part. In any case, from the late 19th century through the late 20th century, Syria ended up becoming the host country for Muslim refugees from the Caucasus, the Balkans, Greece, Turkey, Armenia, Palestine, and Iraq. All of this has culminated in a society which had become remarkably diverse compared to other countries in the same region, both ethnically and religiously, as well as unusually tolerant of one another's practices and differences. While the majority, about 87%, of the country were Muslim by the year 2000, with the majority of those being Sunni. Uh, roughly 10% were also Christian in a mix of Armenian Apostolics, Syriac Orthodox and Catholics. And the remaining people were a mix of Jewish, Druze and Alawite, all three of which are considered both ethnic and religious identities. So this is the Omayyad Mosque. In Islam, places are ranked by their level of holiness this mosque is the fourth holiest place in all of Islam. Uh, and Muslims in all branches of Islam believe that it's not right to represent uh, God or Allah in pictorial form, that we can never know what God looks like. So mosques are often really beautifully decorated with pictures of nature, with tile work and patterns, but never images of God. Another extremely important person in, the, in Arabic history and in, in Muslim history is Salah al-Din. He was a major conqueror in the Crusades. His tomb is right outside the Omayyad Mosque, between the Omayyad Mosque and the Souk, right around it. So Damascus especially is also really significant to Christians. This is the Eastern gate to the old city. You can see that the tower has been added at some point later, uh, but the wall is original. This is the gate through which Paul was carried after having been blinded on the road to Damascus. He was then taken around the corner through that gate and down about a short city block to the house of, of the apostle Ananias where he recovered from whatever that ex medical experience was. Um, that house is still there because Syria is a desert environment. Buildings last for a really long time. Its floor is about 10 feet below current street level, but it's still there. It's been converted into a chapel. People can visit it or could. Um, this is one of the other ancient gates. Uh, Bab means gate or street. So Bab Tum is the gate of Thomas, St. Thomas. Um, this is the area where Armenians typically settled. If you don't know anything about the Armenian genocide, the takeaways are that the Armenian Christians were driven out of Turkey once the Ottoman Empire had been consolidated to basically just Turkey. They drove out about a million and a half Armenians into, people usually just say the desert. The desert they're talking about is the Syrian desert. Um, those who hadn't died on the death marches yet when they got to the famous crossing of the Euphrates River, uh, where you essentially leave Mesopotamia and enter the Arabian Peninsula, there's a famous um, suspension bridge there in the town that spans the river. Um, and any Armenians who were still alive at that point were crucified. Um, others on the way had been burnt alive, thrown into the river. Um, it's, it's a dreadful story. Unbelievably, there were actually survivors and the descendants of those survivors live in this area of Damascus, or did in 2000. Uh, this is a Syriac Orthodox monastery in al Hasaka, or just outside al Hasaka, which, which is the city in the Northeast. Um, this is the remains, the ruins of the biggest crusader fortress. It's called Krasti Chevalier. It was held in turns by Christians and Muslims Basically, Muslims won the Crusades, so they, they had it last. And that's a view of the countryside from the top. Uh, so I'm gonna share a quote from a book that was written by a war journalist named Janine Di Giovanni. Uh, the book is called The Morning They Came For Us. It was published in 2016, so it's pretty recent. She was interviewing a group of soldiers here. He, General Baba, nodded happily. That's it, he said. My family's house is not far from there. He had Sunni friends, he says, and Shias and Jews and Christians. As children, we used to sing, all of us used to sing, 
one, 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 all Syrians are one. The other soldiers remembered the song and one of them began to sing it too. We did not think in sectarian terms, General Baba says. I know you won't believe me, but it's true. So the song referenced in this quote has come up over and over again in the artistic expressions of Syrians, um, at least one of which we'll see later on. During the uprising, Syrians often used this song as a chant during protests in defiance of the regime's attempts to turn sects and different parts of the populace against each other. So Hafez al-Assad seized control of the Ba'ath party in a political coup in 1970. Syria had just lost the Golan Heights to Israel in the Six Day War of 1967, and Assad used this fact to justify uh, keeping Syria's emergency law in place while also never seeming to try particularly hard to regain the Golan. Israel was the official enemy of the state and, Assad, and the Assad regime used this to justify the severe limitations it placed on Syrian civilians through this emergency law. So Hafez al-Assad was an Alawite. Um, he quickly established a new law that said that the president of Syria need not be a Sunni. Alawites are considered by some to be an offshoot of the Ismaili branch of Islam, which falls under the Shia branch. So the two main branches are Sunni and Shia. Remember, the majority of the Syrian populace is Sunni. Um, so yeah, but even a lot of Shiites consider Alawi to be a heretical offshoot and not actual Islam at all. So it was therefore in Assad's personal interest to consider any religious group apart from the minority of Alawites in Syria as his enemies. He declared his government to be secu secular and cracked down hard on Islamist groups in the region. So just to clarify around some terminology, Islamism is not the same thing as jihadism. Islamism is the belief that everyone should be Muslim, while jihadism has come to mean the overt belief in forced conversion or death. There are a few terms that have come to be used interchangeably with jihadism, including Salafism and Wahhabism though there are some specific nuances to each term historically and re religiously speaking. Either way, for a group to be Islamist doesn't necessarily mean that it's extremist, terrorist, or jihadist in its actions. While on the surface, this can look like Assad was just looking to contain terrorist movements, his anti-religious stance positioned him as an enemy to his almost entirely religious populace, despite Syria never having historically embraced the greater transnational Islamist movement, and definitely not any particular jihadist groups. The Assad regime controlled the people's movements and actions through a huge network of secret police called the Mukhabarat, as well as privately paid forces called the Shabiha. This is a word that exists only in Syrian Arabic and translates loosely as thugs. The Shabiha run smuggling and trafficking rings, extort civilians for bribes, perform beatings, and often work in Assad's pr prisons as little more than torturers. The 80s in particular became a time of totalitarian, <laughs> such a hard word for me, totalitarianism and terror, earning Syria the nickname of the Kingdom of Silence by other countries in the region. The presence of the secret police meant extraordinarily low crime rates. The estimate when I was there in 2000 was that one in three civilians were members of the secret police. The regime's secret prisons became the stuff of whispered legend, notably the two in Tadmor, which is the modern day city next to the ruins of Palmyra, as well as one in Sednaya, a suburb to the north of Damascus. Mass graves outside these prisons have shown clear evidence that tens of thousands of illegally detained Syrians were tortured and killed through beatings, rape, electrocution, and acid burns, as well as having their limbs and organs removed while still living. According to a report by Amnesty International in February 2017, at least 13,000 detainees of the Sednaya prison alone had been executed just in the six years since 2011. The culture of silence meant that Syrians didn't dare speak out about the regime's actions. Hafez al-Assad also encouraged cultic worship of himself with statues, posters, and paintings of his image absolutely everywhere. And his henchmen promoted terms like the eternal leader. Um, other ones too, very paternalistic ones like the eternal father, the great father, um, president forever. <laughs> um, there's almost a conflation of like deity with his status. Public and even private criticism of the regime was considered unthinkable and those who did so were detained without due process of any kind. While imprisoned, Sunni Syrians especially were made to change Muslim quotes such as there is no God but, but Allah to, his, to there is no God but Assad. 
billboards such as this one were absolutely everywhere. I actually didn't know at the time when I took the photo, but it's illegal to take photos of them, which makes it very hard to take photos of anything in Syria because they were everywhere. Um, they're in every restaurant, they're in every shop window. Uh, it was actually, which I found out, it was actually illegal not to display one. So I hadn't even noticed it <laughs> at the time, but uh, later when I was looking through my photos, I saw that there was one in the bottom right corner of this photo too. So when Hafez al-Assad suddenly died, apparently um, his death <laughs> prompted outright panic in his top officials um, as his death was totally unexpected. In the early 90s, Assad had named his successor because <laughs> even though they, they hold elections, um, the presidency is inherited. Um, so Assad had named his successor as his brother Rifat. However, during a period of ill health, probably related to the heart disease he died from, um, Hafa suspected that his brother was getting a little too ambitious and renamed his successor as his oldest son, Basal. However, Basal died in a car accident in 1994 and he hadn't chosen a new successor at the point of his death. His younger son, Bashar, or his middle son rather, uh, was working as an ophthalmologist in London at the time and was hastily recalled to Syria to take on the presidency. There were some obvious problems with this. At the age of 37, Bashar was legally too young to be president. Uh, the age minimum was 40. He also had absolutely no political training whatsoever. Nonetheless, he began his rule, and for the first time since the 70s, Syrians began to hope that things might be about to change for the better, and at first it looked like they were going to. Uh, Bashar's wife, Asma, is a Sunni Muslim herself, which made it seem as though he might be a little more tolerant to Muslims than Hafez had been. He also expanded TV networks from the one official state channel to multiples. Democratic debate clubs were opened and allowed to operate, at least officially. However, the arts were still entirely state controlled, much as under the Third Reich, and freedom of speech was only lip service. It quickly became very clear to Syrians that Bashar was not only not better than his father, but might actually be significantly worse. In early 2011, Arab Spring uprisings began in neighboring countries like Egypt and Libya. Inspired by it, Syrians also took up the movement and began to express their own dissent. The uprising began from the ground up. It was never centrally organized, but many cities formed their own local coordinating committees. These were all generally made up of students, artists, activists, human rights lawyers, musicians, and writers. They were committed to peaceful protests, often calling out the word salmiye, which means peaceful, to regime forces to signal that they were unarmed. The demands of the uprising were that Syrians be treated with dignity. Uh, they held regular Friday marches, uh, and called them the Fridays of Dignity. They demanded the release of all the illegal detainees and protested the humiliation Syrians faced at the hands of Shabiha beatings. They wanted freedom of expression, democracy, real democracy, and equal rights for the poor. The beginning of the uprising was marked by two specific events. On February 16th, 2011, just over 10 years ago now, in the southern city of Dara'a, 15 boys aged 11 to 14 spray painted anti-Assad graffiti modeled on Arab Spring slogans they'd found on Twitter onto the walls of a school building. Instead of facing detention or having their parents spoken to, the regime arrested the boys. A crowd of several thousand people gathered the next day to angrily demand that the boys be released. The Assad regime responded by sending in the military to fire on the crowd with guns and tanks, inciting shock and fury from the people. Several shouted out that the squadron leader, Bashar al-Assad's younger brother, Maher, should take the tanks to the Golan Heights rather than firing on Syrian civilians. When the boys were finally released three weeks later, every last one of them had been tortured and had his fingernails ripped out. The people of Dara'a took to the streets in the tens of thousands, using the historic al Mosque for refuge. The regime responded by destroying the mosque, cutting off cell service and barricading the entire city center. This practice of laying siege to any city or region that has dared to object to the regime has occurred over and over again since the beginning of the uprising, uh, resulting in mass starvation in numerous cities. The regime embraced a policy of scorched earth, or to quote their adopted motto, Assad or we burn the country. So th these are photos of that actual graffiti. Here's a wider shot. 
uh, the regime actually tried to cover them up, as you can see, and then overnight people would go back and put them back. So the writing on this piece, so this is a, a piece of destroyed building in the shape of the country of Syria. It says Assad or reburn the country. You can see there's uh, a bleeding hand sticking out from the bottom. This photograph was titled Al-Assad or reburn the country. The second major occurrence to spark all-out revolution is an event now known as the Clock Square Massacre. This event took place in the old city of Homs, an area called Baba Amar. Unarmed peaceful protesters had gathered in the Clock Square in the old city. Just before two o'clock a.m. on April 19th, 2011, the Syrian army arrived and began shooting into the crowd. Tank fire and missiles came next. No official death count has ever been confirmed, but the estimate is around 200 unarmed civilians. The regime's forces then besieged Baba Amr for the next year and a half. These two events in Dara'a and Homs, which are in very different parts of the country, served to unite Syrians in a common cause and launched a full-scale revolutionary uprising. One of the most important pieces of documentary evidence came in the form of the unfinished documentary called Streets of Freedom, uh, directed by a man named Basal Shahada. Basal was killed by the regime before he could actually finish the film. I had, in my research, I had seen multiple references to this piece and was searching actively of a copy for it without success. When I stumbled across it, um, stored in the same archive that I mentioned, it's called the uh, Creative Memory of the Syrian Revolution. Streets of Freedom shows live footage of the first protests in Dara'a, including shots of the 15 boys graffiti that we just saw, live footage of the Clock Square massacre, which is still being denied by the Assad regime, and much more. The regime responded to the uprising with shocking levels of violence, essentially waging all-out war on its own people. So this is a photo of Dara'a four years after the boys and their graffiti. This is the clock square in Homs three years after. This is the infamous suspension bridge in Deir Azor, which is that city I mentioned that spans the Euphrates River. In addition to firing on civilians with guns, rocket launchers, and tanks, the Assad regime has dropped a huge number of barrel bombs on the civilian population. A barrel bomb is basically a big metal barrel filled with explosives and shrapnel, usually nails or broken glass or both. They are classified by the UN as an indiscriminate weapon, the use of which is considered a war crime. The Assad regime has now dropped over 70,000 of these barrels on its own people. Fewer than 1% of the victims of barrel bomb attacks have been armed fighters, whether rebels or other groups. Over 25% of the victims have been children. These attacks have targeted prim primarily civilian areas, including schools and over 580 hospitals. As well, the illegal detaining of Syrian civilians has continued in mass numbers. This came to light on an international level when a defector from the Syrian army who goes by the codename Caesar exposed over 53,000 photos of the regime's torture victims through the group Human Rights Watch in early 2014. With this sort of increase in violence and injustice, it shouldn't come as any surprise that some Syrians did begin, uh, begin to arm themselves in self-defense. The earliest of these fighters were defectors from the regime's forces who reorganized themselves as the Syrian Free Army. However, just as with the rest of the uprising, none of these militarized factions were centrally organized either. To call any of this conflict a civil war is inaccurate. Civil war uh, implies two equal opposing factions. In actual fact, this has been a war of a well-funded, well-organized dictatorship against its own people, some of whom have armed themselves, most of whom have not. Some of the groups who have taken up arms have done so only to protect their own villages and towns from the regime's forces. Others have actively engaged with the forces. The majority of Syrians, whether they would call themselves part of the uprising or not, are unarmed civilians, and the majority of those involved in the revolution have been deeply and vocally critical of the armed factions, which are very much a minority part of the movement. 
I just want to be very clear about that. So this photo that we're looking at is a barrel bomb as it's landing in the city of Daraya, which has taken a lot of bombings. This is the small city of Tataman in the after bomb, aftermath of a barrel bomb attack. That's the kind of devastation it levels. So these are all from that archive I mentioned. So some photos were submitted with commentary. Um, so this one is called, he screams at the top of his lungs, is there anyone alive? This is actually one of my favorites. <laughs> um, this is all that's left of a residential apartment block in Aleppo, just the staircase. So Syrians responded to the regime's brutality, not only with a political revolution, but also a cultural one. When the uprising broke out, artistic expression very suddenly exploded in incredibly intelligent, pithy and poignant commentary on the entire situation. Many artists have used classical art pieces as a basis for stark contrast with the situation in Syria. Tamam Azam is possibly the best known Syrian artist alive today. His pieces unfailingly deliver a punch to the heart. Uh, this piece, the Syrian Statue of Liberty, is one of his. One of the very best known pieces of the re revolution is also one of his, a superimposing of Klimt's The Kiss onto a bombed out building. This one here is called The Syrian Thinker, obviously modeled on Rodin's Thinker. Um, I missed it the first time I saw it, but you can see um, this man here um, is sitting in a similar posture, so they've just juxtaposed those two figures. This is another of my personal favorites of all the pieces in this. It's called The Creation of Adam Under the Rubble. It's actually just made last winter. Many of the artists who have performed or publicly displayed their art have done so knowing that they could well pay for their actions with their lives. Early into the uprising, a renowned oud player, and oud is a stringed instrument, and songwriter named Sami Shukair wrote a song called Ya Haif, or For Shame, which became the unofficial anthem of the revolution, or one of two. Um, one of the central lines of the song, he who kills his own people is a traitor, became a common protest chant. The song was immediately outlawed by the regime, but has continued to be played at marches and on radio stations created by the uprising. Choukair now lives in exile in France. In the city of Hama in 2011, another singer named Ibrahim Kashush led the, the singing of a protest song that he wrote called Get Out Bashar, which also includes lyrics that have been used repeatedly as protest chants, such as the Syrian people will not be humiliated and the Syrian people want to topple the regime. Footage of that night has also been recorded on the Creative Memory Archives. Um, it's now 10 years into the revolution become something that is shared almost every time Syrians talk about the revolution. <laughs> they talk about that time. Um, I've seen um, other, <laughs> other pieces of filming of that same event, uh, but we're gonna watch just a short clip of it. Um, just so you can hear it. As soon as I can figure out how to move this taskbar out of my way. There we go. <laughs> All right. Just have to remember how to find it. Okay. Um, I hope you can hear it. If you can't, someone unmute and say so. I'm not hearing anything, Sandra. Nor am I. You may need to stop sharing this screen, go back to screen share, and in the bottom left corner, there's a share computer sound, which you may not have clicked earlier when you started the slideshow. That's about enough of that. 
All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, as I said, that's that's one of the events that Syrians talk about every time they talk about the revolution. I've attended a few webinars, um, online events that have talked about this, and they always play that. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's partly important to them because uh, the singer who led that, Ibrahim Kershush, was murdered two days after that event. He was found in a river and very symbolically his vocal cords had been ripped out. Syria's most famous political cartoonist, uh, a man named Ali Farzat, had his hands broken by the regime and was nearly blinded in his left eye. He currently lives in Kuwait, but continues to create political cartoons from there. Tamam Azam now lives in Dubai. The penalty for political art, uh, political expression through art has been either death or exile. So this is a cartoon dedicated to Ali Farzat. I'm oh, sorry, it's, it's not by him. <laughs> this is an old version of this presentation, I guess. Um, it's about him. Um, it's titled in French, but what it says, it has Ali saying, it hurts when I laugh, but when I think that Assad is afraid of a pencil, I can't help myself. Which I think is pretty great. This piece is just titled World Press Freedom Day. A lot of the art that Syrians have made have riffed on the theme of the fact that Bashar al-Assad is an ophthalmologist, not a politician. Um, so this one shows him reading an eye chart that spells out the word democracy, but what he reads is kill them all. And the piece is titled, Assad sees things differently. And there's been a ton of art created on the subject of these tens of thousands of illegally detained people. This piece is just titled Siege. It's, it was created during the siege of the city called Maramiya, which killed tens of thousands of mostly kids from starvation. Another fantastic piece by Tamam Azam is just called We Love You, Mr. President, with the Facebook like symbol on this destroyed building. On December 13th, 2012, the photographer Agid Nazar Karim held up a can of spray paint and a camera in front of a crowd in Damascus and said, to those documenting what is happening in Syria as a sectarian war, our revolution is a revolution of people of all sects, and these are our weapons. Karim was killed by the regime the next day, and the day after that, December 15th, this piece appeared by anonymous submission to a Facebook page. This piece is just titled Good Morning Syria. And what it shows here, you can see there's a pile of rubble and little rockets below the window and the hole left in this woman's window is in the shape of the country. The piece was created by a man named Akram Razlan, who was killed by the regime in 2015. Um, that's another recurring theme of Syrian's art is art dedicated to the people who've been, who have spoken out and have been killed for it. This piece was created in memory of Basel Shahada, um, the director of that famously unfinished documentary, Streets of Freedom. This piece is just called Be Between One Scud and Another. The rebel, uh, sorry, yeah, the uprising has had from its earliest days, women at the heart of its leadership. One of the earliest organizers was the human rights lawyer Razan Zaitune. Razan founded the Syrian Human Rights Committee and co-founded both the Violation Documentation Center, which is still operational, and the local coordinating uh, committee in the city of Douma. 
She ran both of these with another woman, Samira Khalil, and two men, while Hamada and Nazim Hamadi. Samira, Samira was married to Syria's foremost intellectual, the writer Yassin al Hajj Saleh. Um, and I'll talk about him a bit more in a, in a bit. On December 9th, 2013, Razan, Samira, Wael, and Nazim were kidnapped at gunpoint and have not been seen since. Now known as the Duma Four, their loss struck a blow to the heart of the uprising. Yassin continues to hope for Samira's return and occasionally publishes public letters to her, which function as messages to the revolution at large. Most other Syrians have assumed that the, the Duma Four are now dead and have grieved their loss on the anniversary of the kidnapping ever since. So this is Razan on the left and Samira on the right. And then Nazem on the left and Wael on the right. This piece is the four of them created one year after their disappearance. This piece was created for Razan uh, five years after her disappearance. Several larger artistic projects have also emerged during the uprising, and I'm going to highlight three specifically. The first and very earliest is called Stamps of the Syrian Revolution. This project took the, act, the form of actual postage stamps in the beginning and has now moved into a strictly digital format to um, allow the artists to avoid detection. Stamps has commemorated everything from individual activists or victims to entire cities. So this one is called for our photographers. Just, I chose this one just to use a familiar name, but this one was created for Basel Shahada again. Another collective calls themselves the Syrian Banksy Initiative. The artist, Kesh Malek, designs stencils, which volunteers then paint onto walls. Their earlier designs used Arabic text, but they quickly shifted to English in hopes of gaining the attention of the West in particular. This is another of my personal favorites. It quotes from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 3. Uh, Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. And then they've added a stamp that says, except Idlib. Idlib is the province of Syria that has, since 2011, steadily received the vast majority of the bombing. Um, to this day, they're still under a constant bomb bombardment. In the northwest of Syria, the tiny, wholly unknown village of Kafrenbel astonishingly ro rose to prominence with the outbreak of the revolution. Barely even heard of by other Syrians, the town is now infamous to both Syrians and non-Syrians around the world. The Kafrenbel Media Project was founded by a man named Raed Fares, a real estate agent turned revolutionary. He also created an important radio station in the region called Radio Fresh and a women's center. Not only did he find his truer voice in the uprising, but he helped others find their own and get heard. He would even use a voice changing software to disguise women's voices as men, men's, the better to have their messages received. The main thing uh, the Catherine Bell Media Project has produced is banners for the weekly Friday protests. Their banners have been in both Arabic and English and generally come with humor or stinging political commentary. Uh, this is this is one of their gentler earlier ones. It just says, may the new year bring your children bread and warmth, not death. So this banner by the Catherineville Media Project earned international attention following the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013. Um, the Catherineville Media Project Center has been threatened over and over again, both by the regime as well as ISIS and other jihadist forces. It's been bombed numerous times and now it's been besieged since 2015. Its staff live in constant danger. Um, so just in case anyone has trouble reading this, their banner says, Boston bombings represent a sorrowful scene of what happens every day in Syria. Do accept our condolences. So you can see how that might not have gone over super well in the US in particular. So Raed Faris himself faced numerous threats, both from the Assad regime as well as ISIS and other jihadist groups. He survived an assassination attempt by ISIS in 2014, but wasn't as lucky on November 23rd, 2018, when he was shot from a van that was following the vehicle he was in. Um, 
he was killed along with the photographer and activist Hamoud Junaid, who also worked at the Catherine Bell Media Center. Uh, while they continued to produce reams of material and operate without Raed, the loss of his humor and perseverance cannot be overstated. Many, many art pieces were created in his memory, particularly ones quoting his favorite quote, the revolution is an idea and ideas cannot be killed. Such as this one. So we're back, back to my photos again. I've mentioned ISIS several times now, um, but before getting too far into that, what I really wanted to emphasize was that the primary threat to the Syrian people since this conflict began has been their own government, not any invading force. The struggle has become immensely complicated with a huge array of foreign influences getting involved from countries to private interest groups. Some of these have included Lebanon's Hezbollah, the armies of Iran, Russia, and the US, all of which have been explicitly supporting the Assad regime with weapons and troops, along with groups including the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, its Syrian counterpart, Jabah al-Nusra, which now goes by the al-Nusra Front, other Islamist groups such as Daesh al-Islam and Ahrar al-Sham, and most notoriously, ISIS. ISIS stands for either the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or Sham, or is sometimes called ISIL for the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, or sometimes just the Islamic State. Its Arabic acronym is Daesh. ISIS caught the attention of the rest of the world in a way that nothing else happening in Syria managed to, frankly. ISIS is a brutal terrorist organization. Um, that's absolutely true. <laughs> Originally part of Al-Qaeda, ISIS is not only Islamist, but overtly jihadist. Where they differed from Al-Qaeda is that Al-Qaeda doesn't believe in the killing of Muslims from another branch of Islam. ISIS does. Uh, so there's the best book on the Syrian revolution to date is called Burning Country, Syrians and Revolution in a War. The authors of that book put it this way, and I quote, ISIS, in other words, is too extreme for Al-Qaeda. Uh, the intellectual I mentioned earlier, Yasin al-Hajj Saleh, discusses this difference between the Assad uh, regime's rigid secularism and Islamist terrorism as two sides of the same coin, famously calling them the necktie fascists versus the long beard fascists. He spent 16 years being illegally detained by the Assad regime in their secret prison in Tadmor. He was actually released in November of 2000 while I was in the country, though of course I didn't know it at the time. The vast majority of his fellow detainees uh, in the prison were Islamists. He saw them tortured for years, both physically and psychologically, forced to renounce their faith, taunted by their torturers that Allah had abandoned them or never existed in the first place. Al-Hajj Saleh wrote numerous essays well before the uprising broke out, warning Syria that the Assad regime was overtly creating radical terrorist movements by treating Islamists this way. He pointed out that those Islamists who weren't killed in the regime's prisons were almost certain to go back to their factions and deliberately create terror. It was almost as though the regime wanted that to happen. If not, they certainly laid the foundation for it. ISIS rampaged across the Northeast in particular, destroying symbols of Sunni Islam, Christian churches and monasteries, and anything representative of a past they wanted to wipe out. One of these acts that cut the most deeply for people around the world, as well as for Syrians, was ISIS willful destruction of many of the structures in Palmyra. When I was there in 2000, Palmyra was considered the largest intact collection of Roman ruins in the world. Preserved by the heat of the dryness of Syria's desert, Palmyra used to be the center for trade in the ancient world, a place where merchants from as far as China, Spain, and south of the Sahara would come to trade. In the late 200s, it was the seat of Queen Zenobia who ruled over an empire that spanned from Egypt into what's now Turkey, both threatening and defying Rome. So I saw the ruins from a camel, which just seemed fitting to me. So that's also why my photos are crooked. I'm just gonna blame being on a camel for that. So this, uh, in any Roman city, um, they would always build an arch of triumph. So this was the one that was in Palmyra. This was the amphitheater. I deliberately took a photo that had some people in it just to show the immense scale of it. 
Um, so I had someone leading my camel. Camels are not the easiest animals to ride, but I was super impressed that this little guy beside me was riding his own camel unassisted. So these structures have basically all been destroyed now. Um, Syrian refugees in London actually reconstructed a form of the Arch of Triumph in London as a commemoration, but yeah, uh, ISIS bombed them on purpose. ISIS is also famous for showing its beheadings on live video, including of international journalists. Um, the journalist whose book I quoted from earlier, Janine Giovanni, talks in her book about having befriended a young American journalist named Steve Sotla, whose beheading by ISIS can actually still be viewed on YouTube. I don't recommend it. Um, ISIS destroyed the Arch of Triumph, the temples of Baal and Belshamin, and much of the amphitheater, uh, as well as a number of other structures. These acts constitute a terrible loss, both for Syrian culture as well as antiquity in general. However, the international outcry over the wanton destruction of these UNESCO World Heritage Sites won vastly more attention and outrage than the loss of life perpetuated by the Assad regime. So Wissam al Jaziri is a, a painter, also one of the better known Syrian artists out there today. So this is just a painting that he's titled Zenobia. Zenobia weeping for the destruction of her city. So in Levantine alphabets, you have to go right to left. So this one is called Zenobia's remnants on the right, which is the Arch of Triumph, and Assad's remnants in Palmyra, which is the Tadmor prison on the left. This is actually one of the most recent additions I made to this presentation. Um, this is a drone captured photo um, obtained by the Human Rights Watch just last May. This is a mass grave uh, near the city of Raqqa that ISIS uh, uses. So all that said, the outside world did know what was, did know what was going on in Syria. The UN has tried multiple times to stage what have proved to be extremely weak interventions or ordered ceasefires that haven't worked at all. A great deal of Syrian art has been created on the subject how, of how incredibly ineffective the UN has been for them and how little the rest of the world has seemed to care about what was happening. For example, during the second round of talks known as Geneva II, the regime killed over 1900 civilians within the nine days that the talks lasted. The UN has never once actively attempted to remove Assad from power and no other foreign entities have even tried to intervene on behalf of Syrian civilians, apart from occasionally selling armed rebel groups weaponry, specifically Saudi Arabia, which would have done that mostly as an irritation to Iran, which backs the Assad regime. While ISIS is indubitably a terrorist organization, the actions of the Assad regime have affected and continue to affect Syrians to a far greater extent. As I stated earlier, Syrians have never historically embraced jihadism and they have made their resentment for the invasion of ISIS extremely clear through their artistic reflections. At the beginning of the uprising, one of the most popular slogans chanted at protests and painted on city walls was, da was down with Assad or Assad leave. Once ISIS appeared on the scene, these same invitations to leave appeared everywhere that ISIS did as well. Um, so you can see this graffiti here, it's on a private residence, it just says down with Daesh. Um, reminded Daesh is just ISIS as it condenses in Arabic. With the same fascist approach to dealing with the Syrian people, it's easy to see that Assad and ISIS really are two sides of the same coin. The Assad regime is secular-based fascism, while ISIS and its ilk are jihadist-based fascism. Syrians have also created a great deal of art addressing this topic as well as that of both ISIS and the regime's attempts to turn the populace against itself in, into sectarian divides, which had never really been an issue before. Uh, to some extent, it has worked. In some cases, the regime's aggressively anti-religious stance and the continued persecution of Sunni Muslims, the majority of the population, uh, have succeeded in driving people who were only moderately religious to draw closer to their faith for comfort. For instance, another frequent cry at many protests ha has been, oh God, we have nothing but you. In certain areas, at certain points where ISIS was actively engaged in fighting the regime's forces, 
it kind of only makes sense that some of the armed parts of the revolution did join in, in on the fighting on ISIS side, um, especially where it seemed that ISIS, ISIS forces were the ones protecting their villages from the Assad regime. Um, yeah, as well as with a few other jihadist groups in the area. Um, but even in these cases, it's really been more about self-defense against the regime than any kind of religious extremism. Meanwhile, Western media has continued to frame the entire conflict as a civil war with an armed rebellion freely supporting and joining ISIS terrorist movement and the helpless Assad regime left in dire need of military support from every major superpower around it. So I particularly like this protest sign. It says, we have been Christians for over 2000 years and we have been Muslims for over 1400 years, but we've been Syrians for more than 10,000 years. This is another piece by the painter we saw, Mal Jaziri, who had the Zenobia portrait before. Um, it's titled, This is How Syria Will Remain. And all the graphics of the shape of the country here read Syrian, Arab, Sunni, Syriac, Alawite, Turkmen, Christian, Kurd, Orthodox, Chaldean, Shiite, Druze, Protestant, Maronite, Assyrian, Armenian, Bedouin. Just showing again that Syria has been, at least for 100 years, a very multicultural and multi-religious society and that the people prefer it that way. This banner says no Salafism and no brotherhood, my sect is freedom. So Salafism again is an inter one of those interchangeable terms with jihadism. Brotherhood here may be an overt reference to the, the group, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is again Islamist. This one just says uh, Daesh and Bashar are one and the same. You can see this is on the right side here. This is Bashar al-Assad's face, but with a typical jihadist kind of beard. This sign, it's standing in its lake of blood, says the Assadi state in Iraq and al-Sham, just kind of conflating the two into one. This one I particularly kept in because uh, it was created by the local coordinating committee of Duma, which means that it was almost certainly created by that infamous human rights lawyer, Razan Zaitune. It says, we did not revolt against a tyrant in the name of resistance, only to get a tyrant in the name of religion. With this graffiti, which says, go back to Afghanistan, you sabotage the revolution. Um, I would say that the, the sentiment in this is very true. Um, the, the majority of the uprising is still an unarmed, peaceful uprising with ideas at the heart of it, um, not weaponry uh, or force. Um, and yet that's the narrative that's taken over, especially in the West. Uh, this man is actually an advocate for disability rights. It's hard to catch it in the photo, but he's a person who uses a wheelchair. It says the revolution is me and you. The revolution is not you or me. This one is another Catherine Bell Media Center banner. It's, it's long. It says churches shall not be turned into houses and shall not be demolished. No parts of the churches will be taken and their cross will be untouched. Christians shall not be for, forced to convert and none of them shall be hurt. Then they actually carried this while chanting a quote from the Quran that translates as there is no compulsion in religion. Um, so that's just Syrians fighting actively against this notion that all Muslims hate all Christians and actively support the wiping out or forced conversion of them. Um, Christians are a minority within Syria, but the majority of the populace was fine with them being there. This one very simply says freedom is halal. Halal is um, the, the Muslim version of kosher, basically, something which is clean and right and orthodox. This final piece of graffiti on this subject, it says Syria is for all its citizens, peace. So on August 20th, 2012, Barack Obama said, Quote, we have been very clear to the Assad regime, but also to other players on the ground that a red line for us is we start seeing a whole bunch of chemical weapons uh, moving around or being utilized. 
This quote both gave Syrians hope that America was paying attention to what was happening in Syria and would eventually intervene and defend them against the regime's relentless attacks. At the same time, it also provoked outrage at the notion that only chemical warfare was a problem for the U.S., that the endless barrel bombs, missile attacks, and starvation sieges that the regime was already perpetuating were fine. The quote also demonstrates that the U.S. was well aware that Syria had chemical weapons, which they had since Assad Sr.'s reign in the 80s, purchased from the Soviet Union. And at this point, a few chemical weapons attacks had already occurred. To this day, Bashar al-Assad continues to deny that Syria even possesses chemical weapons. On exactly the one year anniversary of Obama's famous red line, quote, the regime unleashed sarin gas on the sleeping residents of the Damascus suburb known as the Ghouta. The gas was released between the hours of two to 5 a.m. and killed over 1700 unarmed civilians, about half of which were children. When the U.S. failed to act in response to this, Syrians lost all hope that any help was coming their way. At the same time, the U.S. was negotiating a nuclear agreement with Iran, which very likely contributed to their reluctance to intervene in Syria as, again, Iran was backing the Assad regime. Since this point, Syria has become a theater of war, with all of these foreign powers competing for their own interests and no one defending the country's civilians. The so-called war on terror has prompted the US, Iran, and Russia to back the Assad regime in the name of attacking ISIS, while entirely ignoring the even greater threat to Syrians in the form of their own government. The messaging in Syrian art became quite bitter from this point on. For example, the Catherine Bell banner regarding the Boston Marathon bombing, which took place just four months after this massive sarin gas attack in the Ghouta. So this piece is called The Chemical Attack on Ghouta. Um, sarin gas is white when it's released. So this piece was actually created by an American political cartoonist, but it, they have it on the, the Creative Memory Archives. It shows Obama standing there saying, never mind, it's not a red line, it's just blood. This piece shows two UN inspectors saying if they were really killed by chemical weapons, we'll have to stop Assad. And meanwhile, you have these heaps of skulls uh, showing ways that people have died in other methods. This one says in English, sarin gas made in, made in Russia, and then in Arabic it says tested in Syria. There was another um, attack in, uh, with sarin gas specifically in 2017 in a small city called Khan Shaykhun. It says, Russia and al-Assad kill us by sarin. The world's eyes are on ISIS flags that cover the massacre. Another piece that riffs on a Western uh, art piece. This one is called Love in the Time of Chemical. It's a little bit easy to miss, but you have a woman with a gas mask, but then in the outline of the sarin gas, you have her, we assume, killed lover. And this one, the, the text is a bit hard to read. It says, you and chemical weapons inspectors were sleeping a few miles away. Uh, that's a reference to the chemical weapons attack in 2013, and it's true. There were little... Um, there were a number of UN chemical weapons inspectors there just to look for chemical weapons, and they were literally a few blocks away. So here we have a UN inspector saying, above all, we continue to monitor the situation. Um, the city of Aleppo essentially fell in late December 2016. Another Catherine Bell Media Center banner, it says, Obama needs a third term to decide whether to take action towards Syria or not, but will we survive until then? Uh, this woman's sign says, who said the world was divided? On the contrary, the world stands united to thwart the Arab revolutions. I've always found this one rather touching as well. It says, I, the Syrian citizen, am worth an onion peel to the international community. And it shows this man holding a 
a handful of onion skins. This is another Tamam Azam piece, it's called Universe. Um, and it just really highlights how Syrians have felt very much isolated in their world of destruction and bombing while the rest of the world is out there somewhere and totally cut off. This one is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, in this one, in the bottom corner here, it shows two people and one is saying, I was hoping for a peaceful solution with no strings attached. Then up here we have, you know, the puppet masters of all of these other groups. I'll just highlight the date on this one as well. This was created during the fall of Aleppo, the second largest city, which is in the north. It says, in the end, Obama's red line in Syria turned out to be a river of civilian blood. Syrians have also had a lot to say about the fact that kids have been the majority of the regime's victims. The regime's brutal treatment of those 15 boys from Dara'a were what launched the revolution in the first place. As I said earlier, 25% of civilians killed in barrel bomb attacks have been kids, and about half the victims of the 2013 sarin gas attack in Damascus were kids as well. Even beyond actual death, kids have also been disproportionately affected by other aspects such as hunger sieges, the bombings of their schools and disruption of their education. Since the out outbreak of the uprising, teachers have defected from the state-imposed curriculum, opened their own schools, created their own pro programming. Two teachers from Kaffernbell created a magazine called Zarak, which means boat, for kids aged 7 to 14 and have been circulating it through a network of volunteers through the refugee camps in the north. Another project is the Karama bus, Karama means dignity, which travels around the province of Idlib, dodging bombs and providing any kid who wants to listen with stories, lessons and videos that talk about topics like post-bombing trauma, hunger, safety procedures, as well as the standard school subjects. Syrians have also worked to help their fellow civilians learn to think for themselves after years and years of Soviet style suppression with art, documentaries, political satires, secret radio stations such as Catherine, um, Catherine Bell's Radio Fresh, and educational material aimed at adult audiences as well. Meanwhile, kids continue to suffer to an even greater extent than anyone else. So this is a photo shown of two kids. It's called Playing in the Streets, but it's taken in the aftermath of the destruction of Deir es -Sur. This one's a little blurry. Um, it was a very small photo. It's titled Waiting for Class to Begin. This is one that gets circulated through Syrian social media quite frequently. Um, it has a child saying, the bombing never asked me on which side am I? And here you can see there's a child trying to study here. Green hearts have come to represent Idlib for whatever reason. Um, and the bombs falling on this child are labeled Russia. This is a piece by the same artist who created Love in the Time of Chemical. It's called The Stolen Childhood. This one is titled, I Speak of a Generation Born from the Bullet's Womb. Just to show how big some of these things that fall are. You know, these kids look like they're all having fun. Uh, kids are resilient, but yeah, what a thing for kids to be playing on. This one shows a child writing uh, on the chalkboard, it says, we used to joke and say, God, please destroy the school. And he did. This piece is just titled Barrel. Um, and the people who submitted it to the archive said, we gave a child a charcoal pencil. Look what he drew on the wall. So <laughs> I'm no major interpreter of child art, but I see a helicopter, a plane with something coming out of it, a house, and this is maybe a person. Uh, the child who drew it was six. This 
So um, here we have a well-known actor named Walid Abu Rashad. He's the one in the yellow wig. Uh, they're doing an educational puppet show for these kids, literally in the wreckage outside the city of Sarakib, which is in the province of Idlib. This protest sign said, says, Syrians are not asking the world for love. They just want their children to be safe from death. And this one says, I hope photos of our children don't bother you while sipping your coffee and reading your newspaper. We die here in silence. And this piece of graffiti says, Syria, we would die without you. So as early as 2011, uh, Syrians have started to leave. So I, didn't, I have no idea what time it is. <laughs> um, that's where I was planning to take uh, our break. So in my time zone, at least it's 1051. Um, let's get a coffee or some water or something and reconvene at exactly 1101. <laughs> take 10 minutes. We'll wait for you all to come back before we restart. Okay. All right. So as early as the fall of 2000, Syrians began to flee the country. The decision to leave is unfailingly a gut-wrenching one, and a lot of Syrians' art has reflected on this loss of homeland, reluctance to abandon the revolution or give up on their country, and the decision to flee violence in favor of all of the unknowns of the journey itself and whatever might lie beyond that, uh, including life in a refugee camp, is unfailingly a nearly impossible decision to make. This painting is titled, Death Looms Over the City. Aleppo had three different stages of mass leaving. Um, this was the really big one in early 2014. You could just see like the streets are just flooded with people leaving with anything they could carry with them. Uh, the third and final was after 2016. It's basically abandoned now. I really love this particular photo. It's uh, people from Aleppo fleeing. Um, a lot of times I think when the West thinks of young Arabic men, this is not necessarily the image that comes to mind. Fathers carrying babies. So that song that the general and his soldiers were singing in that journalist's book, um, this piece is based on that. The caption says, one, 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 there's only one person left. This piece was created at the Damascus airport at the departures gate and it's titled, The Day Assad Defeated Me. This graffiti says, when I leave, be sure that I did my best to stay, um, which goes rather, contrary to a lot of the arguments in the West against taking refugees and immigrants, um, that they're, you know, somehow opportunistically taking advantage of countries like Canada um, to have a better life or, you know, which might be the story in some, but for refugees, typically not. Most people don't want to leave their home. The Syrian refugee crisis didn't really catch the attention of the West until the shocking photos of the death of Alan Kurdi hit the news in September, 2015. The photos were taken by a Turkish journalist. The one that received the most widespread circulation and attention shows three-year-old Alan's body lying face down on a beach near Bodrum, Turkey. The Kurdi family were Kurdish. Um, Kurdi just means the Kurd, basically. Uh, they were fleeing ISIS attacks in their city of Kobani. They had initially fled to Turkey, tried to return home, but the violence drove them back to Turkey. From there, they applied for acceptance into Canada, spo sponsored by Alan's mother's sister, Tima, who lives in Vancouver. However, their application was denied because Turkey refused to grant the Kurdi family an exit visa. In desperation, Alan's father, Abdullah, spent his life savings, nearly $6,000 Canadian, to buy his family tickets for what ended up being an illegal passage with human traffickers on an inflatable raft 
designed to hold a maximum of eight people. There were 16 people loaded onto it and the life jackets provided weren't authentic and didn't work. When the boat capsized, the man piloting it uh, abandoned the passengers and swam to shore. Meanwhile, the majority of the other passengers died, including Alan, his five-year-old brother, Galib, and their mother, Rahana. The three traffickers behind this particular operation were actually sentenced just when our first lockdown started, March 14th, 2020. They reached sentence to 125 years prison time. Meanwhile, the world was left with the shocking image of a dead toddler, and the blame for it lies with both Turkey and Canada. Turkey for refusing the, the Kurdi family their exit visa, and Canada's policies for having required one for the application. The story of the Kurdi family is one shared by over half of Syria's population. As of 2011, the Syrian population was about 22 million people. At this point, over 13 and a half million have now become displaced from their homes, either within Syria or outside. Over 6.7 million are officially re registered with the UN as refugees, which is simply a legal designation. Many, many of these people live in camps in nearby countries. Others have tried to escape the region and into Europe, the US and Canada. Uh, so there are two routes into Europe by land through Turkey and by sea over the Mediterranean. Turkey has been so hostile to Syrians firing on them as they cross the border and forcing them back into Syria that taking the dreaded route by the Mediterranean has become the only option for many. So this is a photo that actually won an award. It was taken by uh, Massimo Sestini. He's a, uh, an Italian naval officer taken from a helicopter directly above. What happened to the Kurdis has happened to many, many others. Tens of thousands of people have drowned in rafts as overcrowded as the one the Kurdis took. Other countries in the Mediterranean have become just as hostile to the Syrians' plight as Turkey, with governments ordering their coast guards against rescuing drowning Syrians and even prosecuting those who have defied orders and done so anyway. And yeah, just remember, Syria is a desert country, so the majority of the people from there don't swim. This piece is titled Flight from Death to Death. You can see in the outline of the country, this now familiar sort of structure of a bombed out building and now the typical uh, photo of the very overcrowded raft as well. This piece is titled The Sea. I find it almost nightmarish. You have the shadowy image down here of Bashar al-Assad and sort of a shadowy face of what's meant to represent ISIS and then this very crowded, fragile little boat. This cartoon is called Paper Boats. You can see these sort of monsters gleefully plucking these very fragile boats out of the water. This is the same artist who had the comic about Zenobia's remnants in Palmyra versus Assad remnants in Palmyra. Uh, it says, I wanted to say save Syria, but I looked around me and saw no one, so I kept quiet. Just reflecting on, on that same notion of being torn about leaving Syria behind to drown as well. Another Tom of Azam piece called Mediterranean. And this one's titled the World Refugee Day. So the decision to leave Syria has been hard enough, but most people have had no idea how difficult the journey itself would be. Families have gotten separated. People starve as they wait for admission into camps or the way or on the way to them. Life in the camps is a shocking adjustment for most since the majority of Syrians left roughly middle class lifestyles to face very sudden and abject poverty. The camps nearly all charge rent. There's no legal work available. As far as where the refugee camps are, the rough breakdown is about 3.6 million people living in camps in Turkey, another 2.2 million in camps in Lebanon, 1.3 million in camps in Jordan, 650,000 in Egypt, plus another quarter million in Sudan and Iraq each. This graffiti just shows a tent and says a, a tent can never be a home. You can literally see people in the background with their suitcases as they're leaving their city. 
Tom and Azam again. So this is one of the bigger camps in Lebanon, Bar Elias. Uh, it floods every year. This is the biggest Syrian refugee camp in Jordan. It currently houses close to 20,000 people. The global community's lack of care for what Syrians have been going through since 2011 has continued into the refugee crisis. And one of the greatest blocks to Syrians getting the help they've needed has been, frankly, Islamophobia. The Syrian refugee crisis makes up a, larger, a large part of the wider European migrant crisis. And one of the primary arguments against accepting Syrians as refugees has been the fact that the majority of the population is Muslim. On top of that, the Assad regime has gone out of its way to paint any person who opposes the regime, including by leaving the country, is an ISIS sympathizer, uh, if not outright member. This conflation of Islam with terrorism has come up again and again throughout Europe and the UK, certainly in the US and Canada. In Europe, Germany has by far been the most welcoming of Syrians, both in official policy as well as among the public. Angela Merkel was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize after having accepted over a million Syrians, though that decision has also won her enduring criticism from other European leaders. Munich is the city where most Syrians have arrived, and for a while it was actually a, like a daily activity for many of Munich's residents to go to the main train station there and welcome Syrians, greeting them with coats, food, translators, and volunteers to help them figure out where to go. Some Syrians said they felt like war heroes returning from the war. <laughs> they were almost baffled by how nice people were to them in Munich specifically. This is a, a pro-refugee march in Berlin. Uh, the sign this person is holding it translates as refugees heartily welcome. This is a pro-Syrian refugee march in New York. I couldn't find a date on the photo, um, but I suspect it's around 2015. This is another one here in, in Canada and Toronto. In the US, the Obama administration pledged to take in 10,000 Syrians and actually accepted just over 12 and a half, uh, promising to take another 110,000. However, Donald Trump signed an executive order in 2018 to suspend the acceptance of all Syrians with the exception of religious minorities, primarily Christians. Since that point, um, his administration accepted just over 3,000 in total. The story of Alan Kurdi and the connection to Canada made the Syrian refugee crisis a subject of the 2015 Canadian election, and public support for Syrians actually became quite widespread. Despite repeated attempts to argue that ISIS would use Canada's refugee sponsorship program to invade our borders, there has been absolutely no evidence to support that any member of ISIS or any other jihadist group operating in Syria has even attempted to get into Canada this way. Our system is actually extremely rigorous in its screening process, which you can definitely ask me about later if you're interested. It's very dry reading. Either way, this view was generally a minority one here in Canada. In 2013, the Harper government had committed to taking in only 1,300 Syrians. Justin Trudeau made a campaign promise in 2014 to take in 25,000 Syrians by the end of 2015, and this is now thought actually to have been one of the deciding factors in his victory in 2015. His government moved their original deadline from December 2015 to February 2016 and did fulfill the promise by then. At this point, Canada has accepted over 60,000 Syrians and continues to do so. Operation Syrian Refugees is the second largest single refugee operation that Canada has ever undertaken. Processing centers were opened in Beirut, Ankara, Cairo, and Amman. The first flight of Syrians to arrive in Canada as a part of Operation Syrian Refugees arrived just after midnight on December 11, 2015. Since then, Syrians have integrated themselves into Canadian society, learning English or French, getting their professional equi equivalencies recognized, starting businesses and restaurants, and going on to sponsor other Syrians. Many of the people arriving have needed trauma therapy to learn to cope with the effects of having lived through constant bombardment, the horror of the journey in the camps, 
starvation during the sieges of their cities, enduring grief over the loss of their homeland and their possessions, as well as deaths of loved ones. Kids have often been out of school for six to eight years by the time they arrive here uh, and have also experienced significant trauma. Families that get separated often never become reunited. Families that were able to stay together often struggle to process what they've experienced as a family unit. People who have arrived alone nearly always experience uh, significantly greater uh, levels of trauma. In spite of all of this, Syrians have integrated themselves with better than average success um, compared to refugee settlement in general uh, and continue to profess their gratitude publicly. So this is at the Santa Claus Parade in Guelph in 2016. It's actually a screenshot from a video post posted by Global News. Um, these men and boys were just handing out roses in a mall in Saskatoon just to say thank you to just to anyone who would have one. And I just want to highlight just a couple of very successful business stories uh, here in Canada. So this is Isam Haddad. His chocolate factory and shop in Damascus was hit by a barrel bomb in 2012. He now runs with his son, a shop called Peace by Chocolate, uh, which is in Antigonish. They actually just opened a new store like last week. Um, yeah, this past week. Uh, a documentary is being made about them. Uh, you can buy their chocolate at like McNally Robinson here in Winnipeg. The museum where I work sells it in their boutique. <laughs> and here in Winnipeg, one of the best known Syrian owned businesses is Chaban Ice Cream. Um, I actually got to interview Joseph Chaban. He's a uh, Lebanese, he's a dairy scientist who co-owns the business with Sana Bali, um, his wife, who's Syrian. Uh, her family fled Syria in 2003, early into Bashar al-Assad's reign. Um, they kind of saw the signs and said, ooh, let's get out while the getting is good. Um, they started together a group called the South Osborne Syrian Refugee Initiative in partnership with a couple of churches in South Osborne. Uh, and they've brought over 13 people. Um, some of them were Zainab's relatives, some weren't. Uh, they've bought houses. A couple of the families have had kids since they arrived. Uh, Chaban really enjoys donating ice cream and other dairy products uh, to local festivals, especially ones involved with refugee rights or rights around indigenous peoples. Uh, they're really committed to supporting local businesses as a part of their business model uh, as a thanks for their acceptance here. Um, so yeah, uh, they buy honey from the Winnipeg Bee Project, coffee from DeLuca's, lavender from Sage Garden, dairy products from a farm in Stonewall, and strawberries from Friedensfeld. So the big question people usually ask is where do things stand now? Basically, Syria is still enmeshed in this incredibly complicated conflict. Iran, Russia, Turkey, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, the US, Hezbollah, ISIS, the Al Nusra Front, and multiple other groups are all still active. As recently as September 2020, the Human Rights Watch published another report on Russia and Turkey's involvement in the conflict, specifically in backing the Assad regime to the point of having Russian officers commanding Syrian troops. Bashar al Assad is still president and continues to detain and kill his own people. The regime would be, frankly, unable to operate as it currently is without the backing of Russia and Iran. In, in fact, it would be fairer to say that Russia and Iran have invaded and the Assad regime is backing them. Uh, Iran, in particular, is wholesale occupying large parts of the country, uh, buying huge amounts of real estate for pennies, particularly houses abandoned by Syrians who have fled. The cultural invasion of Shia, the form of Islam that most Iranians follow, serves to inflame the already persecuted Sunni majority, uh, which just goes on to help fuel sectarian violence and gives neighborhoods, sorry, and gives validation to Sunni jihadist agenda. In several areas of, not of Damascus, notably the two historically Christian neighborhoods, signage is popping up all the time, more often in Farsi rather than Arabic, which is what people in Syria speak. Syria's economy is in absolute tatters. Uh, roughly 83% of the Syrians who still live there are living below the poverty line. Food shortages have led to enormous inflation on food prices and electrical outages are common. 
the U.S. has sanctioned Syria on the basis of a 2019 law called the Caesar Act, named for that same army defector who released those tens of thousands of torture photos. And just as with the sanctions on Iraq, the people who suffer the most with sanctions like that are civilians. Uh, sanctioning basically depends on a leader caring whether or not their civilians are suffering. Um, and I think we can safely assume that Assad does not care uh, that his people suffer. And of those civilians, for every one person who has attempted to return to Syria, another four have been displaced. That said, uh, hope hasn't actually been con completely extinguished. This photo was titled, The Sun Rises Yet Again, and it was actually taken during the siege of Homs in 2012. This is the city that Alan Kurdi and his family came from. It says, I love this country, even during its final destruction or devastation, sorry. The uprising has continued, grimly celebrating a new anniversary every year. This spring marks 10 years since the Syrian revolution began. And then other anniversaries are also marked in Syrian art, such as the deaths or disappearances of victims and activists. Um, on top of that, every major religious or public holiday is also commemorated through the specific lens of what's going on. This is another Wissam al Jaziri painting. It's called Ramadan. Ramadan is symbolized by the crescent moon. This is obviously based on Van Gogh's Starry Night. So Ramadan is very much um, like an equivalent of Lent uh, with daily fasting. The end of Ramadan is celebrated with a festival called Eid. Um, yeah, traditionally things like cookies and dates and sweet things are eaten to celebrate the end. Um, these days candy <laughs> is more common. Uh, so this one is called Syrian's Eight and it shows a child angel sitting on a swing made of a barrel bomb. And this just public graffiti on a piece of concrete wall says, may this aid bring you freedom, like, rather than candy, you know? Uh, Christmas is also celebrated in Syria as, you know, a, a family time, much as in most of North America. And it just says, Bashar al-Assad wishes you a Merry Christmas. This one I find incredibly poignant. Um, the quote is from the Gospel of Matthew. It's Christ's last words on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama uh, which translates as, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the painting shows the entire country of Syria being crucified. And this was created during the fall of the city of Aleppo. While so many Syrians have left the country or been forcibly displaced, heroes have emerged among those who have chosen to remain or don't have the means to leave. The Syrians working together to help each other find food and water, find connections or ways out of the country and with cleanup and rescue missions especially. So this piece is, this photo is titled Breakfast in Atarib, which is a town in that very bombed province of Idlib. It shows a long table with a volunteer cleanup crew stopping to have breakfast. You can just see these piles and piles of rubble and devastation. One group that needs particular mention is the Syrian Civil Defense, more commonly known as the White Helmets. This is a volunteer brigade that focuses on rescue missions, often in digging people out of the rubble after a barrel has fallen. As with many other activists, they've been targeted by both the Assad regime and jihadist groups for their work. Um, that said, they persist. Uh, Netflix actually produced an Oscar award-winning documentary about the White Helmets and their work in 2016. Last I checked, it was still on there. So. Meanwhile, COVID has also hit Syria and Syrians have commented on this new addition to the many other hardships they're suffering through their art as well. Self-isolation and quarantine look very different in the Syrian context. The Assad regime has repeatedly bombed hospitals and social distancing is obviously impossible in the camps. There have also been widespread shortages of PPE and testing. And now obviously vaccine rollout is going to be kind of a non-thing. 
This graffiti says the world suffers from Corona. We suffer from Assad. This one is titled Quarantine in Syria. This in this painting, this girl's or drawing, this girl's sign says can't hashtag stay home if you don't have one. Another fantastic Catherine Bell banner. It says the world is tired from one week of isolation. This was created on March 20th, 2020. Remember who's been suffering that for nine years, the occupied Catherine Bell. In this political cartoon, it's titled Why? And the little boy is asking, Daddy, how come we ran out of protective masks in two months? Well, bombs and missiles were always available for nine years. Something that I found quite amazing on a personal level is Syrians continuing ability to care about current events outside of Syria, looking beyond the enormous problems of their own context and commenting through artistic expression on issues going on in the rest of the world too. There was a good deal of support shown for Paris uh, during the Je suis Charlie attack, for instance, and over the spring and summer of 2020, the most recent events commented on have been the murder of George Floyd and the explosion in Beirut. So I'll just highlight again, this was created in Idlib, uh, that province with all the bombing. You can see the devastation around this piece. Lebanon is, has historically been symbolized by cedars, which you can see on the heart in this piece. This piece is titled, Tomorrow Will Be Better. This was taken in the city of Raqqa. Um, this statue was the largest statue of Hafez al-Assad in the entire country. It's impossible to say now what will become of Syria. At some point, Bashar al-Assad will no longer be president, but who can know what will happen then? Many Syrians still dream of returning home to rebuild. Others have turned away never to return. For many, the trauma of the journey away from Syria will be the marker of permanent change, one that can never be undone or forgotten. Instead, these people will focus on putting their roots down wherever they are now. Millions of others are still living in the camps, still caught in the nightmare of the journey. Syrians have been scattered across the world now, restarting their lives in nearby countries in the Middle East, but also in Belgium, Sweden, Germany, the UK, Canada, and many other places. It's meant learning new languages, negotiating complicated visa systems and legal structures, new cultures and very mixed reception depending on where they've landed. Islamophobia continues to be a widespread problem uh, throughout the globe. Some Syrians have moved away from their religious beliefs as they've moved away from Syria, while others have found solace in it and become more devout. In any event, while the revolution has not yet prevailed, some things have changed for good. The Soviet style suppression of freedom of thought and expression has essentially come to an end. Syrians have come to see that thinking for yourself is an option now, and one which they're no longer willing to consider doing without, that self-expression is a necessity, even if the price might well be your freedom, your exile, or your life itself. This man's sign says, don't give me a fish, teach me how to fish. Don't elect a president for me, teach me how to choose. I've always liked this piece too. This man's graffiti says, your barrels killed the fear in us, you idiot. This graffiti says, our battle is a battle of ideas before being a battle of arms. So that message was still, and is still the pre prevailing thought among the uprisers. Um, this was created as recently as 2018. This was created in the hunger siege of Zavadani. It says, it is true that the revolution did not feed our hunger, but it fed our dignity. And here in the rubble, it says, there will always be life after death. There will always be olives. This is the most recent Syrian Banksy project. It says, our revolution flower will, will bloom one day. We will keep trying.
In the book, Burning Country, Syrians and Revolution and War, the authors, R Robin Yassin Kassab and Leila Al-Shami wrote, freedom was born from beneath the fingernails of Dara's children. If the revolution does eventually succeed in toppling the forces currently crushing the Syrian people, it will ultimately be because of the actions of those 15 boys who dared to defy the Assad regime with their graffiti. This final piece says, one day the war will be over and I will go back to my poem. In the end, whatever else happens, the kingdom of silence has found its voice. And once that happens, a people can never be silenced again. So that brings us to the end of the talking part on my part. Um, technically we have until noon. Um, if you want to go, you can go. Uh, but if you have questions or comments, um, now's the time or just thoughts. Feel free to unmute. Feel free to keep your cameras on or off as you prefer. I suspect if folks are like me, there's just a lot of overwhelm going on right now. It's a lot, it was a lot of stuff in there. Sandra, can you explain again to me the difference between Islamist and jihadist? Yeah, so Islamist is not super different from the kind of typical, oh gotcha. Thanks, Justin, I see your comment. Um, yeah, I mean, typically Christians feel that being Christian is the way, right? <laughs> the, the way, the truth, and the life, the one road to heaven. Um, Islamism is the, the, the equivalent belief that being a Muslim is basically the right way to go. Um, jihadism means an overt belief. Um, I want to be careful because historically it didn't necessarily mean that, but a jihad is a holy war. Jihadism is war waged to force people to become Muslim. And Islamists doesn't necessarily um, believe that everyone should be made to be Muslim, just that it would be better for them if they were. But they're not going to forcibly bring it about. Jihadim, jihadism is you must be a Muslim or we'll kill you. And not just mu Muslim, but the right kind of Muslim. Ah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the other two sort of interchangeable terms, Wahhabism and Salafism, are basically like kind of uh, Puritan. <clears throat> um, they're sort of purist movements that try to go back to the roots and really double down on like what's a real Muslim and therefore a good person. So those terms are sort of used interchangeably sometimes too. Uh, Wahhabism is more associated with Saudi Arabia. Uh, yeah, they're like little nuances, but yeah. Become a Muslim or die is jihadism. Go okay. ahead, mom. <laughs> uh, question, what would be the ideal uh, way forward for Syria at this point? And what's even possible? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that same report by the Human Rights Watch in September 2020 uh, very specifically outlined that Russia and Iran and Turkey all need to get the heck out. Um, what's happening under the Assad regime wouldn't be possible without the backing of these much stronger military forces. Uh, at this point, ISIS isn't really a huge problem. I, I want to be very careful about that. ISIS will always be a problem and any like-minded group will always be a problem. Um, they're the KKK of Islam, you know, like we all know that the KKK calls itself a Christian group, right? But the majority of Christians that I know would not consider themselves like-minded with the KKK and its ideals. That's how most Muslims feel about groups like ISIS. Like that is a way out there thing, does not represent my religion or what I think or feel. Um, but basically right now, ISIS has lost the majority of its territory in Syria. Iraq, I'm less sure about, they originated in Iraq. Um, but yeah, they've lost a lot of ground. Um, yeah, so if everyone else who's involved, who's not actively the Assad regime would leave, that would be a huge improvement. 
Um, but Bashar al-Assad absolutely needs to be deposed somehow. Um, there is a democratic process in place that could be used. It's not super strong, but it could be strengthened. Before the takeover of the Ba'ath Party in 1970, there were democratic elections, but yeah. Um, for years and years, Syrians haven't really been involved in the political process. There have been parties. Um, but yeah, most people didn't vote or know how they could vote. Um, no, that's a great question, Justin. Justin asked in the chat, have you seen any evidence that ISIS has been supported or funded by the CIA or other secretive American agencies? Um, that's always a thought. That's always a possibility. It's sort of impossible to know what the CIA does and doesn't do. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, generally speaking, apart from the sanctions, the U.S. has done nothing but support the Assad regime. So, yeah, the U.S. doesn't really stand to gain a lot if Syria falls, and that's all that, you know, the sectarian divide is doing is pulling the country apart. What I do know is that ISIS has not actively tried to get into Canada. I spent three days reading an internal Canadian government audit on the Sir Operation Syrian Refugees. So... I don't know that ISIS has any like specific interest in this part of the world, but so I'm not sure why the CIA would want to, but yeah, I, I haven't seen anything is the short answer. Super welcome. I also have a slice of info handy, thanks to Heather about what our diocese has been up to, um, specifically in terms of supporting Syrian refugees here in our own diocese. So in 2016, four applications were submitted um, and between those applications and others in 2018, eight people came. In 2018, 18 people came. <laughs> it's confusing, lots of 18. In 2019, um, applications were submitted for 18 people. I don't know whether or not they came. Um, I'm going to think they did. <laughs> um, and then in 2020, uh, COVID hit, so travel has been restricted. Uh, so I, I don't know how many have actually made it here. But our diocese is actively working to bring people over. Um, I'm very marginally involved with Holy Trinity's current process of supporting a Syrian couple who are stranded in a camp in Iraq. They're a Kurdish couple. Uh, again, Kurdish people have been affected disproportionately because ISIS was most active in their area. They were already more disadvantaged than other Syrians in the first place. Um, yeah, it sucks. But we're, but we're working on it. Sandra, yeah, uh, we we recently in um, I guess it was 2019, maybe 20, we had uh, another Syrian couple come to Kenora. We already had one Syrian couple with their children here. The latest ones to come were relatives of the first um, Syrian couple. That's fantastic. And they are they are supported by the community. Um, with um, St. Albans, the Anglican uh, Cathedral in, in Kenora being part of that um, support, but a wide um, community support. That's fantastic. I was still living in Quebec City when I think my mom told me about uh, a Syrian family that was being sent to, I think, Altona or Gretna. <laughs> and I thought, oh boy, Southern Manitoba, Mennonite town, how are they going to handle Muslims? <laughs> But uh, yeah, that could be that could be really bad. I hope I hope that family finds a decent welcome. And apparently, it could not have gone better. Like there have been all sorts of like cooking exchanges, and the community just welcomed this family as like our refugees. And um, yeah, last I heard, the family is the refugee family is very happy. So I think that's just fantastic. Um, Morden also accepted, and in fact asked mm -hmm. for many. Uh, Syrian refugees, uh, especially those with the technical skills um, and the medical skills, because they were short on people like that. So that's been a really 
happy coming together of people. Well, yeah. Um, so the typical, this is stuff I learned from working at the, or volunteering with the Sans Femmes Technique de Quebec. The typical refugee profile uh, in terms of people who come to Canada, um, on average have something like grade eight level education, very few, if any, professional skills. Uh, they often don't speak English or French. Um, they typically come from rural settings. So very often from villages without things like electricity and running water. And um, and they very often have to be shown how all of those things function when they arrive in Canada. Um, it's very hard for them to get jobs apart from like security guard or like Dollarama. Um, but uh, yeah, and they often <laughs> have a lot of children, um, which is fine. Uh, Canada is a country that has the resources for that. Um, it, yeah, and budget wise, it honestly does not cost us very much. Um, in 2017, in, in the province of Quebec, the budget for a family of four was $32,000. It's good for one year only. Um, families who come or individuals need to pay back their flight costs at some point. Um, after their one year, they're eligible to apply for social assistance of whatever sort, um, but it tends to be quite tough. Um, yeah, $32,000 for a whole year to cover your housing, your winter clothing expenses. Most refugees, again, come from south of the equator, so they're not, you know, if they arrive in Winnipeg or Quebec City in January, they're going to need a lot of new clothes. Um, if you have eight kids, buying boots for them all is going to cost a lot. Um, if you also need to work out, like, how do I get a health card? How do I take the bus? How do I even apply for a job? Um, or if they don't speak the local language and they need, you know, a hard, intensive four to six months of language training before they speak something locally well enough to work. Um, it's really tough. I went through the language training program for French. Uh, it's meant for immigrants, but... Um, but they will allow Anglophone Canadians to take it. So I know how that feels. I know how it feels to have to learn the local language well enough for the workforce. And it is hard. Um, Syrians are not your typical refugee most often. They tend to be in two very different camps. They tend to be either farmers from the countryside or well-educated professionals from the cities. The top job among urban Syrians uh, is not just doctor, but cardiologist uh, specifically. Um, in Quebec, the process of getting your professional uh, competences, I don't, I don't know what it's, how to say it in English, uh, des compétences, um, recognized officially is complicated. It takes three or four months before a doctor can have his or her uh, talents and skills and certificates and education recognized. Um, but then typically what happens is then they get jobs in hospitals immediately. The second most common job was university professor. The third was lawyer. Syrians, uh, as I said repeatedly, have never been a part of any sort of extremist branches of Islam. So that's not really a problem that they're going to come here and infect the entire population with radical Islam. Um, they also tend to have very few children like one and a half is the average. <laughs> so the country is also not sort of, you know, supporting 13 children per family kind of thing. And it would be fine, again, if they were, we can afford that. Uh, because in Quebec, anti-immigrant anti and anti-refugee sentiment was a big thing, especially from 2016 forward. Um, Justin Trudeau actually came and did a talk about how little it actually costs us. And the example he gave, I went because it was at the local art museum, which was like three streets over from where I lived. Um, the example he gave was of some plane that we have in our military. <laughs> I have, don't ask me what kind of plane, but apparently we have about 50 of them. And so far we, at that point at least, we hadn't used them for anything anywhere. They were sitting in a hangar, probably close to where Justin lives. Um, um, yeah. The cost of one of those planes, he said, would pay for something like 10 million Syrian refugees for one year. Uh, so like, you know, in terms of country wide budgets for a country like Canada's, what we spend on refugees is a drop in our budgetary bucket. 
So yeah, we can afford it. And Syrians are also kind of ideal <laughs> refugees. Um, in the year 2017, in the city of Quebec, the place where I was volunteering is the place that processes all refugees, no matter where they come from, that are coming in through Quebec. And 100% of the Syrians who came in, whether they were individuals traveling alone or parents with kids, took themselves off their support before their one year had ended because they got jobs. It was just a question of getting, getting for some of them, getting some language, but a lot of Syrians already speak English. Um, you saw how many of those signs had English on them too. Um, and a lot of them speak French because Syria was under French mandate for so long. So, you know, a couple of months to kind of sharpen up and then they're off working. Yeah, I specifically, Davies, I was looking to find out if any, um, I was looking through applications even to see if any ISIS affiliates or other, some of the other, like Al the Al Nusra Front, I can't say that, um, that's the Al Qaeda branch that operates in Syria. Um, they're not Syrians, they're, <laughs> they're imported from other places, um, which isn't to say that those places are all terrorists either, but the people who join these groups um, I was looking to see if any of them had even applied to get into Canada through the refugee sponsorship program. Um, and I found zero evidence that, that there was even an attempt, never mind that we, we Canada, uh, found them and stopped them. It's actually really hard to get into the country through the, re the refugee program because the screening is in incredibly rigorous. Anything else before we finish up? I want to thank Sandra and we can all clap. It'll be very quiet, but we can all clap <laughs> for, for your time and your dedication and, and your willingness to share this with us. Um, it's hard stuff to, to live in. And um, I'm, I'm grateful that you were able to do that for us and for the others that you're educating in, all the time, so thank you. And I wanna close with, uh, with prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, look with pity upon those who live with injustice, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Have mercy upon us and help us to eliminate cruelty whenever it is found. Strengthen those who seek equality for all. Grant that every one of us your children, may enjoy a fair portion of the abundance of all that you give. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for your time and your attention, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you all for coming and being willing to listen and learn. <laughs>